الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد بن عبد الله وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار نعوذ بالله أن نكون من أهل النار وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جزيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين We are continuing to cover the topic of people in the Quran and in this section we are talking about the children of Israel as a sample very important community in the history of mankind. We know that because the Quran is full of their stories all over the Quran, from the beginning almost till the end. And we also notice that from the beginning, when we started off, the most important big story is the story of the creation of Adam, the prostration of the angels, and the commitment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken from Adam and his children to take Iblis and his ilk as enemies. إن هذا عدو لك ولزوجك فلا يخرجنكما من الجنة فتشقى. The story of Adam is repeated also frequently because it signifies the importance of what Adam is created for. It signifies the importance of not violating the rules of Allah even for one time. Adam just violated one command and the end result was going through all the tests and the trials and as we explained before this was not a punishment sending Adam to earth being in paradise was the aberration or the experience that Allah wanted to expose Adam to before he had sent him down to earth where he belongs in Jailun fil ardi khalifa next to the story of Adam immediately you come to the story of Bani Israel you see the sequence the story of Bani Israel in the story of Bani Israel we will get to know several meanings of several important issues where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَأَوْفُوا بِعَهْدِي أُوفِي بِعَهْدِكُمْ The covenant Allah has taken from the children of Israel. And if you want to understand from the perspective of the people of the book what their covenant should be, you need to read no further than their own book where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to, uh, according to their record, talks to Ibrahim and he says, uh, as far as Isaac, I will bless. As far as Ishmael, I will bless. And I will make him multitudes of nations. So Ismail, the followers of Ismail, the followers of Ibrahim, became multitudes of nations. They will be numerous, they will be multitudes of nations. So that you and you, you and your descendants may live a life of righteousness. Righteousness means commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you do this, the land I had promised you will be yours and for your descendants from here forward. 
So there is this covenant, agreement, contract, if you will, that Allah has taken from the children of Israel. And this contract is, as we explained before, delineated to us uh, in the Quran. We went over this section, the summary of the covenant, ayah number 12 and 13, uh, 12 in Surah Al-Ma'idah explains that the covenant is to be Muslims in brief. أعبدوا الله ولا تشركوا به شيئا and to uh, to perform the salah to pay the zakah and to act righteously this is the brief summary we went over before so there is no need to repeat it here that section of the story is talking about the the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the children of Israel and the bounties he has blessed them with. This is where he says, وَفَضَّلْنَاكُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ فَضَّلْنَا is to give you more than we have given other communities or other creation. We also explained that that covenant, that part of the covenant, the givings, the bounties, the fadl that Allah gives and gave the children of Israel is mentioned to us in Surah Al-Ma'idah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya Bani Israel, adhkuru ni'mat Allah alaykum idh ja'ala fikum anbiya'a wa ja'alakum muluka wa atakum ma lam yu'ti ahadan min al-alameen It's a huge gift you know, when a village has 10 doctors and the village is 10,000 people, it's a heavy load. When a community gets 24 to 25,000 prophets, almost, almost a prophet for every 100 people, if you count the numbers. That's a huge gift. And then those prophets were all Israelites, which means they are from within the community. And a prophet from within a community means a no stranger. Someone who's known, his history is known. His history is known. His uh, manners, his behavior, his affiliation, his performance, his behavior, everything is known, right? And this is also one of the gifts Allah counts on us as a Muslim Ummah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ Allah has blessed the believers and is counting it as a favor that he had sent to them from among themselves a messenger from their own meaning no stranger. You could verify he is a liar, he is a truthful person. He is a good man or he is a bad man. Uh, is he good to his family? Is he good to his mom? Is he good to his dad? Is he good to his neighbors? So you could verify the truthfulness of the, per of the person and that is what the Prophet ﷺ used when he called the people of Quraysh on the mount called as safa the little hill inside Al-Kaaba today, inside the Masjid Al-Haram. And he calls him and he says, أَعْهِدْتُمْ عَلَيَّ كَذِبًا قط. Have you had any experience in which I was a liar in your views, that I had lied? And they said no. So he asks again, so if I were to tell you that an army is coming from behind this hill to attack you, would you not believe me? They said, we would. Then he declares his message. I am a glad tidings giver and a warner for you to warn you of the coming of the Day of Judgment. Because the Prophet ﷺ was the last prophet before the Day of Judgment. So he uses his background that they know to confirm that none of them holds him to be a liar, a deceitful person, or any of that. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remind us 
of the attitudes of the children of Israel vis-a-vis -vis the generosity that Allah has treated them with. And here it goes, ayah number 49, Surah Al-Baqarah. وَإِذْ نَجَّيْنَاكُمْ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ And remember and behold, when we saved you from the people of Fir'aun. And the people of Fir'aun are not the family of Fir'aun. It is the community of Fir'aun. It is the followers of Fir'aun. It is those who accept him for who he claims to be. So, وَإِذْ نَجَّيْنَاكُمْ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ And النَّجَاءَ is to pick someone out of trouble, to pick someone out of a tight place, to give relief to someone after they suffered. وَإِذْ نَجَّيْنَاكُمْ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنَ What were they doing? يَسُومُونَكُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ They were just سَامَ and يَسُومَ is to be unrelenting. And from it comes the word as-sa'ima. As-sa'ima is an animal that is left to graze in the green land unimpeded, which means they go right, they go left, they go forward, they go back, unimpeded, and they do this constantly. And this is why يَسُومُونَكُمْ then su al adab they afflict you unrelentingly the worst of torment what were they doing yudhabbihuna abna'akum wa yastahyuna nisa'akum they slay your children and they keep alive your women of course we know the story i hope we mentioned before that pharaoh saw in his dream that a young man from the community of the Israelites would be born and this young boy would destroy Pharaoh's kingdom. His kingdom will be gone. And he started to order his soldiers to go all over the towns and whenever they find a pregnant woman, they monitor the house until she delivers. If the baby is a boy, they kill the boy. No questions asked. Why? Because Pharaoh is concerned about a boy from the children of Israel that will destroy his kingdom, as he saw in the dream. In this, it really shows something amazing. A big tyrant like Pharaoh is supposed to be very strong, surrounded with his guards, lots of guards, and supported by the magicians who would still and in still fear into the hearts of the community he is supposed to be very comfortable he has the money and the business community with him right he has the media he has the army he has the police so what else does he need of protection but the story underlines the weakness in the heart of the tyrant the child he fears is not real yet, is not even born yet, right? But still, he gives him sleepless nights, which tells us, fear not the tyrants. Don't fear them. Fear Allah. And don't underestimate the slightest reason that could overthrow him of his throne. A child, a child, and then he goes out of tyranny and Jabarut to kill all newborn children in a specific community for fear of just one of them. And it ends up that this one will be the cause of his demise and the boy that was not born will flip Pharaoh into the ocean or the sea and he will outlive Pharaoh and outlive the people of Pharaoh. This is the story of our day. We have seen nations rise up from the ashes against tyranny and oppression. We are still afraid from Pharaoh 
as he was afraid from the unborn child called Moses. It's an amazing flip of event. But the Quran is telling us, don't fear none but Allah. Because fear equals defeat. If you're afraid, you shrink. You make your power non-existent. You submit to the power even that doesn't exist and to the forces that has no power. It is like our submission to shaitan. Many of us do bad things and say, well, may Allah curse the shaitan. And the Prophet وسلم, says, do not curse the shaitan. La tal'anu shaitan. Why? فَإِنَّهُ يَتَعَاظَمْ He gets blown up. He sees himself too big. What is the relationship between cursing him and him taking the curse and translating into inflated power? It is when you curse, you're asking Allah, you're asking Allah as if you don't have the power to push back. So Shaitan says, oh yeah, I am bigger than the child of Adam. Now I have proven myself. So he feels big. So the hadith is, don't curse the shaitan. Likewise, don't curse anyone. Some of us curse their children when they are angry or pray against them. And the Prophet ﷺ prohibited that, saying that be careful not to do that and don't even curse your donkey or horse or car because the heaven gates may be open and your prayer might be answered and that could be a prayer against yourself so and remember as we saved you and delivered you from the hands of the people of Pharaoh who were unrelentingly afflicting you with horrible torment you know how many communities today are subjected to horrible torment that Pharaoh even did not do to the children of Israel. What did Pharaoh do? He killed the children and he left their mothers to live with the pain of losing a child. And at the same time, uh, his people would arrest people, put them in jail. It is an old practice in Egypt that doesn't relent until today. But today, torture in prisons, in Muslim nations and non-Muslim nations, really is beyond the pale. You cannot understand how could a human torture another human being very close to death. And sometimes all the way mutilate their body even after death. How could some humans burn other humans alive? Whether putting them in gas chambers or burning them, just burning them alive. But it's happening. Allah doesn't wrong any single human being. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا We have to keep saying this. وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Because when things go wrong very badly, some, unfortunately, some Muslims, they ask the question they should never ask. They say, where is Allah? The believers ask, مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ Right? But some Muslims are asking, where is Allah? Those poor, innocent children are being killed, whether in Syria or Iraq or Yemen or Libya or anywhere else, or Myanmar or Chechnya or anywhere. So they ask, where is Allah? Allah is always here. But the question is not, where is Allah? The question is, are we up to the task? Are we up to his promise? Have we fulfilled our side of the covenant with him when we said la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah 
صلى الله عليه وسلم Likewise Allah asks the children of Israel وأوفوا بعهدي أوفي بعهدكم Fulfill the covenant you gave me I fulfill the covenant I conferred upon you This is a reciprocal relationship Some of us don't understand the reciprocity element of our relationship with Allah So we end up treating Allah as a standby emergency God Our heavenly 911 You don't call 911 every day, do you? Right? Only when there is a crisis Right? Allah doesn't like this Allah doesn't like it And he gave us examples in the Quran That he doesn't like people who only call on him When they are in a tight situation When they only spend when they have millions But short than that they wouldn't spend Allah says يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ Likewise يعبدونه في السراء والضراء يدعونه في السراء والضراء This is the issue That you don't relate to Allah only When the going is tough and rough And you're getting to an exam You're getting to a surgery You're getting into trouble Or you are in trouble Allah is telling us Remember Remember me so that I remember you To set the tone for a reciprocity Reciprocity means mutual relationship In which you have a role And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to you فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُ بِي Respond to Allah so that Allah would respond to you When He calls you answer Then when you call He is going to answer as well So our relationship with Allah is not one-sided Allah is always there But I will only call him when I need What about when he calls you? Then the second level which is a little bit better Is when people respond to Allah But only when they have nothing else to do When they have nothing else to do And the Adhan calls Where are you going? I'm going to the masjid but when they are busy doing anything Then the masjid becomes secondary Or even lower But this is better than Never going to Allah unless you need Him This is a little bit better Then there is This kind of attitude where people Come to Allah But they come reluctantly Hesitant They would rather do something else but since we are here, let us do it And the reciprocity element in the relationship we have with Allah Will continue to influence our place and value in the eyes of Allah As we always say, if you want to know how much Allah loves you Just check your heart how much you love Allah And if you want to see the evidence that you really love Allah Look into your life and your behavior Are you following the Prophet Wasallam? If you are Then you really, really truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So the reciprocity that was set in the covenant Between Allah and the children of Israel Is still standing between Allah And everyone who committed to believe And follow and obey so they kill your children, the males of your children, and they leave the females. This is a very, very serious trial and test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes when somebody does something bad to us, we are focused on that person or that institution or whatever the source is, that we forget the fact that they couldn't hurt us without Allah allowing it to happen. So the question shouldn't be, 
what should I do to them? The question is, how bad that Allah would let someone do this to me? Am I not good? Should I question Allah? Or should I question and run after a human being? Or should I ask myself, look in the mirror and ask, what did I do wrong for Allah to allow that much pain to be inflicted upon me from a fellow human being? Why do people hate me? What do I do wrong? But when we deafen our ears and close blind our eyes, we don't see truth because even if you want to look in the mirror, you will continue to see the faults of others and you will see yourself as flawless. And this is how we deal with each other, including the closest of kin. When you have any squabble with your wife or husband or children or parents, you always see yourself as you are on the right and the other side is on the wrong. And when you discover or when you are told, but you did this and this is wrong, you give it the justification, the abuse excuse, and say, he started it. He made me do it. She made me do that. Which is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. So we need to look into reciprocity, both in our relationship with Allah and in our relationship with each other. وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ After Moses and his community uh, went east, as Allah told them, Pharaoh and his people ran after them. فَأَتْبَعُوهُمْ مُشْرِقِينَ And when it came to the ocean, to the sea, I'm sorry, وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ And remember, as we split the sea, split the sea, can you see a huge sea in front of you? It takes, by the way, about two hours there was no uh, Suez Canal. It was the real sea. And the cross, it takes about one and a half to two hours crossing the sea in an engine ship, which didn't exist then. So we're talking about, about six hours in a normal ship. So Moses and his people knew that the challenge is tremendous. But Moses trusted Allah and he said, Inna ma'ya rabbi sayahdeen. Allah is with me and he is going to guide me. And he did. When they faced the sea, one of the followers of Moses took his horse and started to charge into the sea. But he couldn't go much further. Two, three times. Then Allah told Moses, split the sea with your stick. Just hit it and Allah would split it. So they would walk on the seabed, the sea floor, and the water is opening in front of them and on their side. It's an amazing miracle. I know that in your head now, trying to imagine what happened is itself mind-boggling. But what about if you live through it? If you imagine living yourself through it, you were running and your enemies are running after you, and they are maybe a few yards away, you are walking on your feet, they are riding their horses and chariots, they are coming. And Moses' followers were very afraid. They said, looked back and they said, Inna la mudrakun. There is no way we can escape this. They will catch up with us. And Musa says, Nay, kalla, inna ma'ya rabbi. Sayyidin, he told me to come here. I came here. It's up to him. He will do it on his time. But we are under his watch. That trust at difficult time also is absent from our heads and hearts. When you're going through a tough time, we don't remember Allah except by way of dua. But we don't remember that 
إن يمسسك الله بضر فلا كاشف له إلا هو. If Allah afflicts you with something harmful, only Him, only He can give you relief. The only one that gives you relief is Allah. The only one that gives you cure is Allah. So we remember to ask Him, but we don't trust like Moses facing. And this is where the cliche comes. البحر من أمامكم والعدو من خلفكم The water is ahead of you and the enemy is behind you. You are in this tight spot and you trust Allah. You don't spread fear into yourself, let alone others. Because your trust level is such that you submit to him all of yourself, your resources, your children. Bani Israel, they left with everything they could, including, of course, gold and other currencies. Very important. فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ We saved you. وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ And we let the people of Fir'aun drown. Again, imagine yourself. When you run with the tyrant, there will be a crash point. When you are supporting a tyrant, when you are supporting the wrong regime and the wrong people, there will be a crash point. It's like a train running on the wrong tracks. Definitely, there will be a crash. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا فَتَمَسَّكُمُ النَّارِ Don't rely on, don't trust to go with those oppressive people and regimes. Why? Lest fire would touch you. وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ Look at this word here. وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ So the sea that opened for the children of Israel, wide open, and the floor is under their feet, and the water is held up like mountains on both sides, and Fir'aun and his people are running after them, and they thought that the sea will hold on until they cross but Allah told us, أَفَنَجْعَلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كَالْمُجْرِمِينَ Do you think we will treat good people like evil people, like criminals? Pharaoh, in the zealotry of pursuit, wanting to kill Moses and his people, he forgot that he stepped on the sea floor. He forgot to look to the mountains of water next to him on his right and on his left because his eyes are focused on Moses and his people. He wants to finish the crime. So as the helpless run away for their life from tyranny and oppression and we see them, we see them crossing the Mediterranean Sea, running out of oppression. Middle Eastern nations, who are majority Muslim nations, have turned into large prisons. So much so that you talk to any Egyptian, they will tell you, الداخل مولود, الخارج مولود, والداخل مفقود. He who enters, he is lost. And he who has an exit, and exits, he is given a new birth, a new life. And this is not only true in Egypt, it's true almost everywhere. More than 75% of people polled in the Middle East, they would rather not live where they are. And the rest, they are afraid to wish for the same. <laughs> they don't want to speak, which means oppression has become a norm. The story of the children of Israel teaches us never accept oppression. Never normalize oppression. Never normalize injustice. 
Some of you may say, what is it about all of this political stuff today? But this is the Quran. <laughs> if Moses were to bow to Pharaoh, would Pharaoh have wanted to kill him? But would Miss Moses then have been the prophet he has been? Would Moses have been recorded in history as a leader who saved his community by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He guided them and he took every risk with them. Wherever he went, they went. And wherever he told them to go, he went ahead of the whole community. Leaders do not lead from behind. Leaders do not lead from behind. They don't become leaders. The definition of a leader is someone who has followers. So if you lead from behind, you don't have followers. You are the last in the line. So for the purpose of today, two blessings Allah counts on the children of Israel and he will ask it of them that they show gratitude, that they show repentance, which they would show and come back, and they will be good for days and then very bad for other days, and they will keep going back and forth. Hence comes the term Hada, which means Raja, Yahud, which is a verb name. Yahud is a verb and a name. The past tense is Hada, which means Raja, right? And the present tense is Yahud. He keeps coming back, either to his old habits or to repentance and forgiveness. Then he goes back to his old habits and so on and so forth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our ummah benefit from these lessons. اللهم آمين الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد Brothers and sisters uh, not this Sunday, but the Sunday after, Dar al-Hijra is hosting an open house. We sent invitations for our neighbors and the society and interfaith uh, partners and churches and synagogues to come and share a meal with you, which means you are the host. You are Dar al-Hijra. And uh, I hope that everyone will try to participate. We expect to get full house, inshallah. So people that you cannot talk with in your casual encounter with them outside are coming to your home. They are coming to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to share a piece of bread, a meal, and a nice word. If you have any question about this, talk to me or talk to the administration, but we will need your support. We will need your support, both in your coming, in helping, in organizing this event, in helping as a volunteer to receive the people coming to your own place, to the house of Allah. You will be their human host. Allah is the host for all of us. So brothers and sisters, our interaction with our neighbors and the society at large is the only and strongest antidote against Islamophobia, animosity, hatred, and the spewing of venom from some sources. Your stance will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ahdina fi man hadayt, wa aafina fi man aafayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa qina wa asrif anna sharra ma qadayt. اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا 
وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا سائلا إلا أعطيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته ولا ظالما إلا قصمته اللهم اختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وأقم الصلاة